Amen. I just want to say uh, again how grateful we are uh, that you are here, and especially even as a guest and church family alike, it's a good day to make much of Jesus. And I mentioned a moment ago our Facebook Live, and for those who are watching on wherever you may be, we want to welcome you into our service. And I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 15 in this last I Am statement of Jesus. And as I do, I want to say something that I think speaks to all of our hearts. That is, we want to be able to come to the end of our life and say, I live life to the fullest. Uh, have you ever heard anybody say that about somebody? Some ways it sounds a little trite because uh, I can't speak for everybody at every service, but it's kind of the summary of someone's life experience, that they live life to the fullest. Today at about three o'clock, I'll be standing in a cemetery with a beloved family, and we will be celebrating the final moment uh, for that family, celebrating the life of a loved one. And I can tell you that she lived life to the fullest because she knew Christ, and everything about her life uh, was about the worship and the magnifying and the lifting up of Jesus and who she was. And when I think about uh, the message of the world, when I think about all the things that uh, appeal to our hearts, uh, especially when you see it as social media and so many other things that we're inundated by, the advertisements of the world, a billboard or some sort of mailer, wherever you go, we are inundated with this message of be significant, uh, find happiness. I read an article this week where someone said that today so much of the world appeals for us uh, to embrace our expansion, slow down the savor of the moment, and at the same time, hustle like you're Beyonce, whatever that means. It's like we tell people that if you're going to live fully, buy the plane ticket, quit the job, plan the trip, wander into the unknown, open your heart, take the leap, jump, go for it. And all of that may be uh, good in a sense if it's about Jesus, but we know uh, that no matter the adventure, no matter the effort, apart from Christ, for what Jesus had to say to his disciples in John 15, uh, that there can be no fullness of life. That the fullness of life is a life that has been reserved for the believer and those who love Jesus. And that article that I had read this week that appealed to the significance and the meaning that every one of us have a desire for really gets at the truth in part because we have a desire for significance and meaning. And God put that within us, but you know, we want that because we were created to know God. And we need to know, most importantly, even as believers, that to come to know the Lord is where we find our identity and our significance. So much of the world is fleeting, isn't it? I think about as a pastor, a minister, most importantly, as just a follower of Jesus, uh, what is most important in life? I often think and reflect in ministry about what are we teaching people? What are we pointing others to? And it's our prayer that we are pointing people to the person and the work of Jesus. He is our message. He is our hope. He's our song. He's our savior, our redeemer, our comforter. He's everything. He's not someone to, at a distance, to be admired, but someone to know personally. And God wants you to know him. And I want to say a couple things to you at the outset of this message. That when it comes to a full life, I don't know where you may be, but you can know what a full life is. And secondly, you can know what a full life is today. Even if you're a believer and you're walking at a distance from God, you can leave here today looking into the full face of Jesus and know the fullness of his life within you. But I want to give you one other quick word, and it's a warning. That warning is that in our pursuit of the fullness of life that Jesus offers, there will be no shortcuts for any of us. The pathway will always be the pathway of the cross. And when we pick up John 15, we find our place with Jesus with his few hours, that final evening spent with his disciples. By the time you come to John 15, Jesus has taught much about 24 hours before he would go to the cross on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a believer, when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit come to live within you. That sounds somewhat mystical and mysterious, but it's the truth of God's word. It is Christ in you. That's what the New Testament teaches. So think of this. Jesus is ready to go. And just like all of us, when someone you love leaves you, your heart is broken. You don't want them to go. We naturally desire for people to stay and to be with us. Jesus knew this. But it's almost like every step that he took, he was struck with the urgency of time. He's teaching as he's walking. 
And you know where Jesus is walking in John chapter 15? He is walking to the garden. And there in the garden, the Lord in his humanity would lift up his heart to his heavenly Father, and he would submit to the pain of even the cross. And what a moment that was. And as Jesus is leaving, though, he keeps saying to his disciples, I don't want you to fall away. I want you to know that I'm leaving. There's one to come, the Holy Spirit, who will come to live inside of you. My work will continue. You can know me. I want you to know the fullness of my life. And in that, in verse 1, that's when he is walking along and he says these words. Look with me. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Jesus said, I am the true vine. It's as if he's walking along. And there with his disciples in the shade of the evening, he sees what was common. A vine lying on the ground that would often wrap itself around the tree. And Jesus looks at that vine and he says, I am the vine. My father is the gardener. Verse 2, he cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Notice in verse 4, remain in me. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And I want to tell you that from the bottom of my heart, I believe that this message, in terms of both the secret of what it means to be a believer, abiding in Jesus... And really, the secret to a healthy, godly church is found here in John chapter 15. Uh, No matter our age, we'll never improve on what Jesus talks about when he says that you need to abide in me. And as we abide in him, we know full on then the fruitfulness of the Christian life. And that's really where I want our focus to be in this moment at the end of this series on the I am statements. And if you take your bulletin on the back side, there's a little section there of outlines. And if you're a note taker like I am. You want to take down some notes. I put there a way in which to understand what Jesus is saying about abiding. But when you read the rest of this chapter, you'll see that John, as he often does, will say something that's true, and then he'll build on that truth, and he'll repeat himself for emphasis. So the words abide and fruitful we're going to look at are both repeated. But for our time, we're going to look at just the first five verses, okay? You can read the rest of it later, but this is at the heart of where I want us to go. And we're talking then about that spiritual life that comes from abiding in Christ. And what does Jesus have to say about this? Well, first of all, he talks about the necessity of abiding in Christ, the necessity. And now when Jesus says that he is the true vine, circle that word, he is setting himself apart from all of those who had come before him. You see, in the Old Testament, the picture of God's people was that of a vineyard. Matter of fact, all of the Jewish disciples, and they were all Jewish that were there in that moment, would have heard Jesus. And when he talked about the, the vine, they would have thought about what God said of Israel in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 5 is the song of the vineyard, and God lamented that he wanted to be uh, the, the God of Israel, and he wanted Israel to be his people, but they rejected him. They were faithless, but yet God is faithful. And it's like all of the kings and all of the prophets who had come and gone through the ages had failed to really point people to the vine. But Jesus comes along, and he says he's the true vine. No wonder he says he's the way, the truth, and the life. And when you follow him, you always find in a confident way the blessings of the Father. Now, what does the Father do? Look with me the latter part of verse 1. Jesus says, I am the vine, probably pointing, likely pointing to a vine that was nearby. And he says, and my Father is the gardener. I want you to think about this spiritually speaking. The necessity of our need for God is wrapped up in the fact that our Creator is the only one who knows how to change us and to transform us into the image of His Son. And so our Creator and Christ, our Redeemer, together in this work of our heart, alone can change us. Uh, That word there for a gardener can also be translated as a farmer. You know, there's not anybody who probably works harder than a farmer. They get up before the sun rises. They till and work of the day under the heat of the sun and the sweat of their brow until after the sun sets. It is hot and hard 
work. They work with their hands, and everything about them is an act of service to the tilling of the ground, and they know well their fields and all of the work that needs to be done. Think about this. Spiritually speaking, the Lord knows every part of your life. He knows every hang up. He knows every setback. He knows every concern. He knows every dilemma, every anxious thought, and he is adequate, though, to still say, I want to do a good work in your life. If you know me, I'm going to do a good work. The Bible says that he will complete this work that he has begun within us. Aren't you grateful for that? Uh, There's an old song, he's still working on me. Don't judge me yet. There may be an unfinished part. There ought to be that sign upon my heart, he's still working upon me. That's the message here. So we need him. And Write this down. Your spiritual life, my spiritual life depends then on being in relationship to God. Uh, This is a necessity and not a luxury. Now, let me say something you may want to take exception to, especially as hot as it's been here in uh, mid-September. But, you know, air conditioning is a luxury, okay? Now, I know some of you are about ready to argue. You're very saying, no, 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 no. It is a necessity. No, it's a luxury. Some of us who are here, it's the way I was raised. I'm not saying it's preferable. It's what we had. We had no central air conditioning. We had window fans. We would put these box fans in the window. We'd raise the window at night, and that air circulating through the room, that was our air conditioning. Can I get a witness here? Anybody raised like that? Amen. So it's a luxury. It's nice to have, but it's not necessary. Air conditioning is a luxury, but air is a necessity. You can't live without air. You can live without air conditioning. You can't live without air. And the heart behind all of this is as Jesus is pleading and speaking to his disciples, he's saying something that the church needs to recover today, and that is this awesome dependence upon God. We understand that when we come to God for salvation, but somewhere along the way, we often forget this as it relates to our spiritual maturity. But the same need that brings us to the cross is the same need after we come to the cross that keeps us still depending upon God. And he is good to do this. There's the invitation of what Jesus is saying. I am the true vine. You need me. And he goes on to give us two ways in which Jesus uh, and the Father, they work in our lives. Look what he says there at the beginning part of verse 2. He says he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. And then he also says that uh, he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So you have the the work of God in the cutting away of dead branches. You have the work of God in the cutting back of fruitful branches. Uh, We need a pause to consider this because there are two separate things here, and they're very important to the work of God in our lives. That uh, when you and I understand that Jesus is talking about dead wood, uh, we take warning that uh, we would not have any deadness in our own heart. But notice, he's not even talking about a saved person here. You see, when he goes on, look with me back in the text, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. He's talking about those in Israel who had professed to know God, but their hearts were far from him. You remember that occasion when Jesus was going to the temple, and as he's walking along, he saw a fig tree from the distance. As uh, the disciples and Jesus came upon that fig tree, he noticed that although outwardly it appeared to have life, upon closer inspection it was dead. Do you remember what the Bible says Jesus did? Jesus actually cursed that fig tree. Now, you you might think, well, that seems uh, a little out of place. The Lord is cursing. Well, he's not cussing and just having a fit in the way we may think about cussing. He was pronouncing as a creator a curse over that tree as a sign that spiritually speaking, it is not enough to appear to have life. Those who are in the kingdom must actually possess life. And the only way that we can possess life is in the person of Christ. Uh, That's why there's always a danger in church. People can be so close and so far away. But notice, that's just the cutting off of the branch. Now, I want to take just a practical example of what we do every day or on the weekend in our yard. And I don't know how big your yard is. My guess is uh, at some point, sometime, if you've tended to your yard, you know it's a lot of work. Uh, You're going to be in the sun. 
and uh, you're going to be trying to cut back tree limbs and raking leaves. I just cannot stand raking leaves. I don't know what it is. I, or trimming back hedges and shrubs. I don't mind cutting grass, but I do mind the shrubs. But it's all hard work. But when you cut a branch from a tree, or you cut a little part from a plant, or you, or you do that on a flower, what happens to that part? It becomes dead because it's not connected to the vine. Jesus is saying that the people of God and Israel, they are dead because they are not connected to him. And so we know that when you are detached from uh, the Lord, that you are spiritually speaking incapable, spiritually speaking incapable of any life change. Uh, you take a, lim a limb, uh, you, you take a, a, a branch, you cut it from the tree, you have sealed the fate of that branch. Now, the tree will go on to live. The tree can live without the branch, but the branch cannot live without the tree. I remember in our first pastorate, a well-meaning man, and he was a good person and uh, loved the Lord, but he said that there was a season in his life where he got mad at the church, and his wife and uh, himself were so faithful and busy within the church, but something happened they didn't like. And they got all bent out of sorts in that particular, so they stopped going to church. Uh, this isn't an uncommon thing, but this is something that happens within church life. They got disappointed. Here's what he said. He come full circle back to his need for Jesus and his need for community. He comes back to church, and uh, he said to me, preacher, he said, I just, I just remember learning this lesson uh, that I had to learn. That is, that I could leave the church, but the church will make it just fine without me. But I needed the church more than I ever thought about what I could contribute. Now listen, there's a balance to that. The church belongs to who? Christ. He is going to see his purposes accomplished, but he has called us, though, to be part of who he is. And that's where he talks about this other work. Look with me. Highlight that he cuts off on one hand, that's the unfruitful branch, and then the pruning of the other. And the pruning. Now why do you prune something? Uh, you prune something because you want life and vitality to take place. Some of you green thumbs know this, that your, your work is never done in a flower bed. Can I get a witness? Weeds are always ever present. They, they are fruitful and they multiply. As soon as you, you just get into a flower bed and you're not, just, you're not just weeding. It's not enough just to weed eat a flower bed with mulch. You've got to yank that up by the what? The roots. And you want to take it all so that the sustenance of the soil and then in the actual tree itself, the sap will get to the healthy places for maximum life. So you might say this, well, I'm a believer. And when I signed up to follow the Lord, I thought I was going to be removed from the scissors, the divine scissors of God pruning back my life. Well, let me remind you, you're just signing up for that. Because when you and I come to the Lord, there are going to be things in your life that just like mine, God's going to say, I'm going to have to cut that back. I'm going to have to remove that in your life. And that is what we call discipleship, because as we follow Jesus, that's not altogether easy, but it is necessary if we're depending upon God for life. And so we submit ourselves to him and we let the Lord tend to our every need and he removes the weeds. But the goal is different than the cutting out. In the first unfruitful example that Jesus gives, the goal is one of judgment. The one who is dead will remain in their deadness. But the one who knows the Lord, the goal is different in that God wants to promote spiritual maturity. So life is in view, wrath for the unfruitful, but God's grace in the second. And if you're here and you feel God's pain, don't confuse the two. Sometimes in the church, we confuse uh, what God's doing in our life. And we often question, God, how can you love me if you're allowing this into my life? And that's the reality of every believer. And I love the word um, that Pastor Courtney taught last week in James chapter 1. Uh, this is why the scriptures urge us to go to God for wisdom. Because we need to know the difference between when God is pruning our lives and he's removing things and, and for us to submit to that. Uh, but as we think about the difference, sometimes only God knows and we have to rely upon him. Jamie and I 
had for years a plant that we kind of received from a special event. It was either a wedding or a funeral service, I believe. We talked about that in between services. I've been trying to think about where we got uh, that particular plant. But we kept what we thought was a plant for years. Well, we moved two or three times. And in that moving, we kind of lost track of uh, what this plant was and, uh, and even where we had gotten it. But uh, we took care of it. If we moved, that plant moved with us. We put it in its right little uh, pot, and it was on our porch right there at the front door. People would come, and we'd want them to see that plant and think, wow, they have nice plants here. We watered that plant. We tended to that plant. Well, we had some friends come over from our church, and I discovered uh, that Chad, uh, the husband of our, of, our, of our friends that had come, Chad and Michelle, that he had a degree in horticulture. And I thought, this is my chance to find out what this plant is. So I said, Chad, can I show you a plant and you tell me what this is? So I walk over to our, uh, our porch over to the side again. I said, now, what is this plant? And he looked at me and he said, Philip, that's not a plant. That's a weed. <laughs> so for about six or seven years, we carefully tended to a weed and we put it in a pod, and we set it out on our front, front porch. We want to tell you that if you're not careful in your spiritual walk, you will be watering the weeds in your life rather than uh, the branches and the things that God wants to flourish. Only God knows the difference. Through his word and his spirit, listen to me, he leads us to spiritual maturity. You are not going to escape. None of us are going to be outside the divine hand of God. But oh, when you submit yourself to the Lord and you say, Lord, this is painful and I need you and, and your will be done, well, then God brings Christ likeness. See, that's spiritual growth, Christ likeness. And in the middle of all of that, he says uh, that it's the fruitful one that will then be able to bring what? More fruit. Some of the greatest believers I know have gone through the pruning scissors of God at a rate which seems to be disproportionate to others. Have you ever had something happen in your own life and you've thought to yourself, Lord, I know you're teaching me a lot through this trial, but I know a few other people who might need to use this same lesson. But yet God knows what he's doing. He's either mistaken or he is all wise. He is either hard towards those who love him or he is good. And seated all over this worship center are people who know what it is like to walk through pain and sorrow and setbacks and lost loved ones, and husbands, and wives. And I just want to remind all of us that if you know God and you're seeking Christ, none of that is wasted before God. We may not know all of the wives on this side of eternity, but we can trust the heart of our Heavenly Father uh, because we depend upon Him. In verse 3, Jesus says, look with me, He says, you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. He was saying this because when you put your faith in Christ, positionally speaking, uh, positionally speaking, we are saved and holy, uh, and we are given God's Spirit at salvation. Think about that. We are grafted in to this great vineyard of God, but along the way we get dirty. And that's what Jesus did in a couple chapters before this one in John 13 when he washed the feet of his disciples. What a moment this is that Jesus removes the outer garments, and he takes upon himself in that moment the actions of a house servant. And he gets down on the floor, and he washes the dirty feet of his disciples. No wonder Peter said, uh, Lord, I can't let you wash my feet. And Jesus said, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can have nothing to do with me. And he went on to say this, that uh, you take a bath, and you are clean, uh, but through the day you walk, and the feet get dirty because of the world in which you walk through. You know, as believers, God's called us to himself. That is holiness. That is purity. But we walk through this world, and what happens to all of us? We get dirty. Our feet get dirty. And so the Lord cleanses us. We get saved one time, uh, but forevermore, we got to keep coming under the hand of God. Now, how do you do that when you get dirty? There's a gift that God gives us. It's called repentance. I used to think that if I repented, somehow I would upset God and I would, I would uh, in some way disappoint him because I was sinning or I had let him down. So I lived in this denial that maybe, Lord, 
Uh, I won't confess it and we'll just forget about it and maybe you won't even see it. But that was when I was a new believer. I've received repentance as a gift because it's the only way in which I can, I can connect to the vine and let God keep working in my life. Listen, that's what God's invited you to do. A dependence. But quickly, this dependence, though, brings a choice. And I want you to write this down. In verse 4, Jesus talks about a responsibility. And uh, as I think for time's sake, I want to be very clear about what I say, and I want all of it to be uh, right from God's Word. So I want you to write this down. This is a choice that we make. It is a choice that we make. In the original language, verse 4, that word remain is in the imperative. Jesus isn't giving a lofty suggestion. He's not giving a hypothetical. The Lord is saying that it is a necessity for you to depend upon me, but you have to make that choice. I want to ask you, how did you get here today? You got here today because you made the choice to get here today. Somehow, by God's grace, you woke up, whether you set the alarm or you naturally woke up, you got in your car and you drove intentionally into this parking lot, walked through these doors, and you're sitting in this service. Now, I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but listen, you and I have the kind of spiritual life we desire to have. God has forever saved us. That is Christ in me. Salvation is Christ in me. But what Jesus is talking about in terms of the fruitfulness of our life and the fellowship of our life, that is us remaining in Christ. Now, we do that through his strength, but we have to make the choice. There are no robotic Christians within the kingdom of God. Every single one of us who know the Lord have the kind of walk with him that we've chosen to have, and we can't really walk with him in this way and remain in him unless we understand what Jesus means then by remain. That word could be translated several different ways. It speaks of a dwelling. It talks about a, a, uh, a remaining here, the NIV translation. I think of it in terms of its relationship to the word home. Jesus, I really believe, is saying this in the same way the Spirit makes His home in our heart. He goes on to say in chapter 14 and verse 23, the Father's love will be at home in your heart if you obey my word. Jesus is saying something that uh, we, we need to know, and that is that our hearts are like a home, and God wants to be not just a guest, He wants to be able to live there in complete healthiness and wholeness. You know, we all, we all say something to each other when we invite guests. I'd say it to you, if you come over to our home, I'd really feel this way. And you would also say this to me. You invite a guest. Now, help me finish what I'm about ready to say. Your guests are at the front porch. You invite them down into your living room, and you say something like this. Come on in. Make yourself at home. Uh, but don't get carried away. That's what we're thinking. Make yourself at home. Don't get crazy. We don't really want you to go lay down on our bed and take a shower and go through a tool shed and take the gallon of milk home and really live like this is your house. We just want you to make yourself at home. But don't get crazy. And I think spiritually speaking, what Jesus is saying in the same way is in the same uh, approach that we take with Jesus. Lord, come into my life you can sit here in the lazy boy recliner. You can help yourself to the fridge, but stay out of my closet. Stay out of my storage shed. Don't want you down in the basement or upstairs or in the attic. I just want you right where I want you, but you make yourself at home. You know what we have said? We really don't want the Lord to rule over our lives. We just want a manageable Jesus. And the work of my life before God is that God as a father will not allow me to manage him. He will, through the Spirit's work, keep, keep removing and cutting back in his love for my good, for his glory, his purposes. And the choice is this, that God, under your grace, I'm going to submit myself to your pruning hands because I need you. You can talk about it in terms of a connection. That to be abiding in Jesus is to be connected to him. A couple ways in which we do that, through the word of God. I want to say to you in a kind way that if you are not daily in the word of God, if you don't have a devotional life, I'm talking about 
a, an approach of which you're trying to know about God, you cannot uh, remain in God and abide in him. It's not possible to remain in God apart from his word. And that speaks to our prayer life. All of us could talk about how we need to pray more. Let me just say, start somewhere in the word and start somewhere with your prayer. You know, the best way to begin is with a sincere heart. It is just saying, Lord, right where I am, I need to hear from you. That's the word. That's why we come together. That's why we, in our personal lives, leave this place. We'll open up the Word tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. We're trying to get a hold of who Jesus is and see Him perfectly. There's nobody like Jesus. I read that phrase over in the book of Jeremiah, my personal devotional reading. What a phrase. Nobody is like the Lord. And if you'll find that to be true, it'll be like a revival in your life, that God is working and He's moving. But it comes to a sense of helplessness. Look with me in verse 4. Jesus says, if you remain in me as I also remain in you. He's saying, if you remain in me and the model of what it means to dwell and to remain and be faithful is how I function in your life. I will never let you go, but I'm going to give you the choice for how you're going to respond to my love as a believer. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Do you believe that in your life? You know, one of the dangers of ministry is that you feel like that sometimes you can just do this apart from the power of God. You know, the dangers of a church of when God blesses is that we feel like we can just take care of this and we, we, we can do this. And the more years of experience that you get and you're blessed with facilities and people and spiritual gifts, you think, well, Lord, I, we kind of have this, but that's not the way that God works. The Lord is saying that you can do nothing apart from me. Now, in my flesh, I try many times, and uh, the Lord brings me back time and again. Philip, it's not going to work this way. You're going to have to depend upon me in every season, whether it's a need for comfort, whether it's a need to walk through a temptation, whether it's a need for direction, you have to depend upon me. It's the difference between asking for help. You know, sometimes all of us will ask somebody for help, and you know, it's a casual sense. Maybe you need something unloaded from the car. And you'll say, hey, can you give me a helping hand? Maybe you're in the kitchen and you're saying to, a, to your son, your daughter, your husband, or your wife, say, hey, can you give me a hand here? That's one kind of help. But you know, there's another kind of help in life. It's the help of somebody who may be struggling with taking their own life or depression or suicide. And their help is no casual request for a helping hand. You know what they're saying? I can't do this alone. I need somebody to intervene. You see, the spiritual life is a life where we have that kind of help, and we come to God, and we say, Lord, I can't really do this on my own. Lord, all is vain unless the Holy One of God comes down, that old song. You see, this speaks to every heart. Now, I don't know what season of life you're in, young person, a teenager, middle-aged, single adult, married, a senior adult. But here's something that's true about spiritual maturity. Age is no sign of spiritual maturity. You can know the Lord for 60 years and be spiritually immature. You can know the Lord for 10 years and have a spiritual maturity. How do you get there? You come there when you get this heartfelt dependence that says, God, I need you. And when you breathe that and you think that and you're surrendered, all of the help of God comes. And in verse 4... He states it negatively. He says, uh, you can do nothing apart from me. But in verse 5, he states it in a positive way. Read it with me. He says uh, one more time, I'm the vine. I'm the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. Would you write this final thought down? It's the promise of abiding. A fruitful spiritual life comes from an abundant life in Christ. You see, fruitfulness and abiding go hand in hand. Some 10 times that word abide or to dwell or to remain is mentioned in this passage when you read the rest of this chapter. And it's no accident then that the Lord talks about abiding and fruitfulness in the same way. Do you know why we don't have more fruitfulness in the church? Because we don't have more abiding. And I want to point this out to you, that none of us are to sit in judgment on others in terms of where they are before God and whether they're saved or not. But, the, but God does give us spiritual fruit for a reason. Spiritual fruit 
gives to us the expression of the nature of who we really are. You see, we do what we really are. Uh, Whenever lost people act in lost ways, we know that's a very natural thing to do apart from Christ. But in the spiritual realm, spiritual people to do spiritual things. And this is why God, this is why the Lord gives to us in his word a picture between uh, the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. I want you to write this down. You can read through it later. It is a tough but needed passage to read. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In summary, he talks about the works of the flesh in that that passage versus the works of the Holy Spirit of God. These are expressions, okay? In in the flesh, he says in verse 19, chapter 5 in Galatians, here's what the works of the flesh look like. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. I read that and I think that most believers at that point would say, well, those people are just awful. And then we read on, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness. It's hard for us to understand the, in our world today, but in the Roman world, this was common. Orgies and the like. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He is saying this, that those are the works of the flesh. If you and I were to plant an apple tree, and let's say we're going to have a First Baptist apple tree right out here in the yard. In a few years, we're going to pick from that tree apples. We would start with the seed. We would plant the seed. We would water the tree. It would become a tree. We'd nurture the soil. And then sooner or later, we'd pick the fruit of the tree. What are we going to pick out? We're going to pick off apples, of course. That's the seed. In the spiritual kingdom, the fruit that we give off comes from who we really are and what we are feeding. He says the fruit of the Spirit of verse 22 is different than all of those things. He says the fruit of the Spirit is, I want you to listen to this, and I I think about it in my life. I say, God, I just want this to be so true. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when I read that passage and I go back to the fruit of what Jesus is talking about, I am struck by where I am and where I need to go. And I thank God that there's a roadmap for every single one of us here. Because when the Lord talks about fruit the first time, he just talks about fruit. Every believer ought to at least give some sign of fruit. If you have absolutely no fruit in your life, that is a major concern. If there's no fruit whatsoever, no love for God, no love for the word, no desire to be a community, no sense of conviction over sin, that needs to be an alarm in your own heart. I call the self-examination of what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, but I want you to hang on with me. If you know the Lord and you feel the weight of God, that is not altogether where my life looks when I think about the fruit of the Spirit, God in His goodness calls us to trust Him, and it's the work of Christ in us that produces that fruit. Branches aren't frantically saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. Branches are naturally fed from a tree. Christians just keep looking to the Father. We keep letting the Master Gardener tend to our heart, and through the Spirit, the gift of grace, He works these things out in our lives. And then He says, if you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. So He goes from fruit more fruit, and then he says this, much fruit. You know, you can measure spiritual maturity in those three ways. Some fruit, by God's grace, I want to give more fruit. I'm talking about my love for Christ and desire for him to be everything in my life, at home in my heart, dwelling in him, connected to him. I want to be Christ-like. That's more fruit. Ultimately, much fruit for the glory of God. You see, that's what God's called us to. That is the invitation of God in your life. He wants you to know him and to bear much fruit for his glory. Yes, you. Yes, today. And you can have this. This is the gift of God. But you and I can never have fruit any more as a church than we can can have in our personal life apart from being connected to him. The Lord said to his disciples, come now, let us leave. And before he leaves, he gives us this wonderful picture. I don't know what you think about when you think about church, but my desire is that when people come here, and our desire is that people come and they feel the presence of God, 
They see that Jesus is lifted up like a living person. And, and that he who conquered death, nothing is a match for him. He can conquer anything. And uh, no matter how far we are or near, uh, we have a father that we can go to. I saw something recently where it was a picture of a young boy that sinned and he messed up. And here's what he said. I'm going to have to run and hide because dad is going to be mad at me. But there's another caption right next to that one that said this. Same boy. I've sinned. I need to run to my dad because he can fix this. Do you see the difference of the love of God? See, that's the invitation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, church family, as we uh, take a moment to pray here about our trip. So we went with wonderful host, the pastor, Billy Ross, and his wife, Diane. I did not know that they were French connoisseurs and spoke the French language, and it was a wonderful time to go with them with a ministry that is teaching people the word, World Hope International, World Hope uh, Ministries International. 60 different countries. So do you know the need of every country is the same? It is a need for Jesus. Now, of course, we went, and I wanted to dig a little deep. I didn't want to go without my dear wife. I paid for her to come with me, and I thought, we've got to go and to see this and to be there, the ministry, and experience it. And uh, we would spend one day 10 hours, 10 hours in one church, teaching through a translator. Uh, They didn't have air conditioning in one building. It was like a little window at the top of the ceiling. And I just thought, this is a Saturday. These people are off work. Like, what are they doing? And I'd ask someone, like, what is it that drove you here today? One young couple said, uh, you know, we just really feel like we need to know God more. We could use more teaching of the word. Another lady had a friend with her. I thought they were a couple. And I asked her about him because he had slipped out before we ended. And she said, uh, well, I don't know where he is spiritually, but he's a friend. And I'm concerned for him. But I just believe if he could hear the word, that it would stir his heart up to knowing who God is. We were at another church. It was a refugee ministry, and it was f- some four languages. Isn't that amazing? One service. And, uh, and so we just basked in that, and it was wonderful and delightful. But to hear their stories. One young man's 24, and uh, Greerd said that uh, he had come to know the Lord, having uh, fled from his native land, which was Iraq. I said, well, what's your story? How did you come to know the Lord? And he said, Uh, My dad and brother were killed by ISIS. My sister had already fled the country. Whenever I became a refugee, he said, my sister kept inviting me to her church. He said, all I knew was my religion. And I would study in the Quran, the teachings that I had. And although he was skeptical, he went with his sister. She said to him, if you'll come, you'll experience something different uh, than you've ever experienced any time before. He said, and when I came, these people were so loving that the love of God was something I never knew before, the love of God. And I thought about that that whole week, and I'm still reflecting on this trip, and I'm glad we're a mission-going, sending church, and I want God to make us more fruitful spiritually here and to see a harvest of people come to know Jesus. That's what I pray for for our church. That's why we're seeking Him in 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's not like we're just seeking him and then we're leaving. I'm talking about really just feeling God work and to have that kind of a heart. But as a trip like this goes, it doesn't matter where uh, I may go. I want to see things and sights. And we snuck in a couple places and we went to the most visited site in the world. I would rather have no sleep than to have missed this, to have missed this. And we went to the most visited site in the world. Over 10 million people went to see it last year. And you know what it's called? The Louvre. It's the famous museum. And now we did a drive by there. You could spend an entire week. And I don't particularly find myself to be um, an artiste or sophisticated, but I appreciate art and I appreciate antiquities and certainly history. And we went and we pay more uh, than we should have. And uh, I said, we're going to go to this museum for just a drive by, but I'm not going to come this way without seeing the most famous painting. You know what the most famous painting is? the Mona Lisa. I had somebody after the first service show me a picture of their Mona Lisa. I thought, how do I know you didn't get that off the internet? (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) So we got in line and we waited for one hour, an hour to see the Mona Lisa. 
Now, Leonardo da Vinci, when he had painted this, what would become a masterpiece, could never have known that it would be what is considered today the most priceless piece of work in the world. According to a French custom law, it cannot be bought or sold. It belongs to the people. And so there at the center of this museum is the world's, one of the world's biggest attractions, and certainly at the top of the world's uh, artistic work in terms of value, and people are lined up, and we go up one floor, and up a second, and a third, and an escalator, you know, they keep you guessing. You think you're almost there. You keep going and going. We're passing by all these other works of art. And so the couple in front of us were Americans, and I just finally said to them about halfway through, um, why are we waiting in line to see the Mona Lisa anyway? And they started laughing. They said, we don't know. We're just supposed to see it. It's the Mona Lisa. I said, I know. So we got into the room, and the only thing that really moved me was the line. They were pushing and shoving us all the way through. And yeah, when I saw it, it was great. And people were taking photos and looking at this masterpiece. And when I thought about those churches and those believers, and I think about this museum, I wonder today if we don't see and mistake Jesus as more of a monument to admire and a painting of something to behold rather than a savior to live and to worship. Listen, Jesus doesn't want us to line up for religious activity. He wants us to come with a heart that when we see him, the Bible says that Jesus declared, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. He is the portrait of God. According to the authors of, author of Hebrews, he is the exact representation of God in character and holiness. And when we come to him, he can do for us what no other false god or image can do. He can save and declare and cleanse and forgive. See, that's what God can do. 